gather round, children. Now, pay attention at the back and Johnny... Don't do that. Some people lucky enough to drive under the Clifton Suspension Bridge on the Portway in Bristol may have not even seen one of Bristol's least kept secrets, lurking as it does inside the rock face on the Clifton side of the River Avon. Even if you did know it was there, it hardly leaps out and bites you, and that's because it was very cleverly designed to be a thing of beauty in its own right, but not to impact on the spectacular view of the rocks that surround it. How very British. The upper station is close to the Clifton Suspension Bridge and is located adjacent to the former Grand Spa Hotel, now the Avon Gorge Hotel, or whatever it's called this week. The lower station is opposite what's left of the paddle steamer landing stage in Hot Wells. The Clifton Rocks Railway is an underground funicular railway in Bristol, England that ran up the inside of the Avon Gorge, linking Clifton at the top to Hot Wells and Bristol Harbour at the bottom in a tunnel cut through fort lines in the limestone rock. Construction of the railway was funded by the publisher George Nunes, also the proprietor of the Linton and Lynmouth Cliff Railway. You may be wondering where you've heard of Nunes Publishing before. In the 1970s and the 1980s, they had such massive titles as Women's Own and Practical Mechanics in their stable. Not many people know that. The railway was opened on the 11th of March 1893 and carried 6,220 passengers on the opening day alone and over 427,000 passengers in the first year of operation. No However, despite these figures, it was never a great success and in 1912 it was sold to the Bristol Tramways Company, but it continued to struggle. Well, it would really, wouldn't it? It closed completely on the 1st of October, 1934. The end. Thank you very much for listening. And if you'd like to follow me on YouTube, please click on the link below. Except that wasn't quite the end. Far from it, in fact. The Clifton Rocks Railway has had more comebacks than the Rolling Stones, more twists than a box of curly whirlies, and is a really interesting story at the same time. You wouldn't get that from women's own and practical mechanics now, would you? Interested? OK, let's get started. So, what the heck is it? Well, it's at this point that we need to keep the technical people happy for a bit. Don't worry, it doesn't take too long and normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. We are talking underground funicular railways here. The railway had a length of 450 feet, 137 metres, overcoming a vertical distance of 200 feet, that's 61 metres, and a gradient of about 1 in 2.2, that's 45%. Nah, no clue. There were four cars in two connected pairs, essentially forming two parallel funicular railways, each running on 3 foot 2 inch, 965 millimetre narrow gauge tracks. The system was operated by gravity, with water ballast being let into the cars at the top of the station and let out again at the bottom of the station. There was also an oil or gas burning pump returning the water to the top of the system and then it starts all over again. There, that wasn't too bad was it? <laughs> To explain this system in very easy to understand language, we have acquired a very old rare audio recording of a boffin explaining how this technology is used on the Clifton Rocks Railway. Good evening. Some rainy poles offer you either highly mileage or wet grip in the nasty rainy slippy slider, but very boat loaders. Now P3 has a mine bog load combinator of two steely belties and an extra nylon fold beltie. This delivereth maximos my loads and outstanding fold in the wet gripper. Oh, horrendous expensive fold, right here you utter it. But no, P3 is thrifty much on your banky balancer than barber load P3. All clear now?
In March 1940, the first company to move into the tunnels after the cars and funicular jiggery pokery had been moved out was the airline company BOAC. That stands for the British Overseas Aircraft Company, who used it for offices and storage. Now, not much else is reported on this occupancy, so I think we'll move on. As the Second World War intensified, blast walls were installed into the tunnel, and the tunnels became used as a relay station by the BBC, who also constructed an emergency studio and network control room there, although the latter was never put to use. The BBC needed to keep broadcasting through the Second World War to try and distract an estimated audience of up to six million people away from the blatant propaganda of one William Joyce. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. An American-born English-educated fascist whose exaggerated upper-class accent soon earned him the name of Lord Haw Haw. Today's BBC would love to have similar listening figures to that of Lord Haw Haw. They talk as much rubbish these days as he did then, so it only seems fair. The BBC had to face up to the fact that Broadcasting House in London might be badly damaged by bombs or even taken over by invading Nazis. The BBC decided to set up an emergency headquarters in Bristol capable of handling programme production if the need arose. The disused railway tunnel of the Bristol Port and Pier Railway was earmarked for BBC occupation. Despite the emergency situation, in a true blue act of eccentricity, the BBC, as only the BBC could, sent its entire symphony orchestra down to Bristol, consisting of nearly 100 musicians, to play in the proposed tunnel under the baton of the famous conductor and athlete, Sir Adrian Bolt. One can only presume that the BBC wanted to ensure that even if Britain was about to be completely and utterly destroyed by the Nazi jackboot, radio listeners should not be denied broadcast symphony concerts of the highest quality whilst the bombs drop round their ears. The maestro reported favourably on the acoustic properties of the tunnel and Britain had been saved by the good old BBC. Whoa! Unfortunately, a delay incurred in adopting these procedures had upset the BBC plan somewhat. The Director General was vexed. Eee, I am vexed. And he also visited Bristol in person to inspect the tunnel and to kick some bottoms. But the Nazi Air Force beat him to it, and after a series of heavy raids, local people were occupying the tunnel for shelter and safety. The BBC had already considered the use of the Rocks Railway Tunnel, but had rejected it due to the anticipated difficulties of coping with the steep incline. Circumstances now dictated that they should construct their alternative base here in Bristol. So construct it, they did. All the transmitter-related stuff was shoved into the top chamber. Second chamber down had a studio. This was equipped with piano, gramophone and other facilities for musical, drama or schools programmes. Poor acoustics were improved by installing heavy carpets and providing strategically placed quilting on the walls. The third chamber down was the recording room, containing recording and replay machines which used gelatine-coated celluloid film. Sadly, no vegan option was available in these days. There was a war on, you know. And onto this celluloid film, recordings were cut with a sapphire stylus. Also within this room were sufficient recorded programmes for many weeks of broadcasting, a sort of early BBC iPlayer. Fourth chamber down, the control room. Here, the BBC engineers surpassed themselves in compressing an enormous amount of equipment into a very small space. The room incorporated switching gear for no fewer than 80 telephone lines leading to outside stations and studios. The post office routed these lines in various formations to minimise the risk of a single bomb damaging them all in one go, and also, presumably, to cut down on the amount of spam callers.
The three smaller rooms at the lower ground floor level. Now, these rooms held special emergency diesel generators, a special force ventilation plant in which precautions were taken against gas attacks, and a canteen containing sufficient food and water for several weeks' survival. The control room was manned day and night, translating countless thousands of programs into many different languages and then feeding them into various transmitters. However, the emergency studios never had to be used. Just in case, when the bombs began to fall on Bristol during the war, key programme staff used to pile themselves into an armoured dodge shooting break a car by the way and make a dash to the tunnel where they would stand by and go on air if required. Thankfully the main studios at BBC Bristol were never silenced. Yes, Radio Bristol is still at it. July 1946 the war was now over and the BBC had reviewed its transmitter and studio capacity and was ready to terminate its tenancy and remove all of its equipment except for the heating, lighting and ventilation plant. The ventilation plant had cost £1,600 to install, cheap as chips, and it would cost £104 to remove. Bargain! The Bristol Corporation were prepared to purchase all this plant for the princely sum of £5. Happy days! Not too many annoying cliches there for you, were there? And so the war was over and the tunnels entered their retirement phase. These days, a voluntary group, which in 2008 became a charitable trust, aims to preserve and restore the railway and wartime structures. It's not feasible or desirable even to get the railway to run again due to the wartime structures sitting on top of the railway lines. The cost of complete restoration is estimated at a whopping £15 million. In 2019, a proposal to turn the top section into a museum was announced. Pay them a visit. Check the internet for opening dates and times. The old tunnels haven't looked this good for many years. (laughs) 